Hans, Danny. <laughs> hey, oh, yeah. how are you going? Yeah, good. Thanks for coming on a little bit earlier. No, no, I actually preferred it too. I've had a busy, busy, busy few days and I'm just knackered. How are you going? What's been going on? Uh, what's been going on? Uh, what, like last couple of days or last month yeah. and a half? A couple of days? Yeah. Just working working on a photo shoots, just a commercial uh, advertising photo shoots. For... That's exciting. That sounds so like just... fun. Yeah, it's good crew. It's nice people. It's just... Anyway, let's jump into it, Danny. Great. Tell us who Cut. you are and what you do. My name is Danny Cabs. I also go by uh, several other names like Daniel Cabrera, which was the name, uh, my birth name and my name on my birth certificate and passport. Then my, uh, I'm also Poncho Orange, uh, Poncho Orange, and I speak like this when I'm Poncho. Uh, I've also been known as Chico, also Danny, Danny Peñares. Hey, how's it going? Um, my name's Danny Pinares and I'm a kids entertainer. And I'm also D. Hi, I'm D. D double E. You better spell a right or I'll come get you. Yeah, that's who I am. And and I'm uh, I guess you you put it on like my bio says that I'm I'm a fun fun facilitator. So I, I just like to bring play into people's lives through um clowning and um, physical comedy and physical theater and interactive theater as well. Uh, you've seen I think you've seen me do stuff with interactive theater at Jungle Love or something like that or yonder yeah. or something at yonder i saw you and i thought it was so good yeah it's fun it's fun it's it's really silly uh, i think we did a dating show yes it was literally the best thing that happened at yonder and i did a mural at yonder and i actually thought that your performance was the best thing yeah it's it's really incredible i don't know I, for the people uh, listening uh, it's we we go in just a few actors like a little team of actors and and performers but we set up a a scenario so in, in the case that that you or um, Maddie, it was a um, dating show where you had a, a contestant and three contenders and there was a partition so the contestant couldn't see the contenders. The Those four people all came from the audience. So they were all just people, you know, watching and wanting to be a part of it and, and they get to tell their story and they get to crack jokes and go on, you know, tangents and all that kind of stuff. But it's guided by us, the actors. And in the end, you know, two people get to have a little mini date where we set them up with a little cocktail cocktail side of stage and they get to see if they want to hang out more or not and, and we move on to the next group it's like 20 minutes per session 15 20 minutes per session and we run for about an hour and a half and and we go through about five six seven groups of people it's pretty fun yeah i think you also married people at the end as well we, yeah that's another scenario we have it's called sanctuary of seduction where we marry whoever wants to get married and yeah and we also have another one called kangaroo court where we <laughs> you can sue your friends. So, you know, the actors are just like a judge and two barristers and, and we, we guide people to sue their friends for stupid stuff and and the outcomes are always very positive. Like, okay, you've been sentenced to a group hug. Um, <laughs> um, we all have to, you and your group of friends all have to be pickles and roll around on the ground like pickles. And I don't know, it's just stupid. Um, I love but it. It's fun. it's fun. Yeah, it brings play into into our lives, which I think is really important. So would you consider this like comedy? Because I consider it comedy because I'm like laughing the whole time. Yeah, yeah, it's it's comedy. Like it's it's comedy, but not delivered in a, in a way of just jokes. It's it's comedy through through play so it you know the the we, we make it light we make it funny so we can uh, c connect with people more you know because when we have humor um we we listen so and, and that's very much what I what I do with my Poncho Orange character as well when I make my solo shows that are a, more, a lot more stage shows where it's just me on stage delivering something. You wrap something that's meaningful within a comedy context and, and people digest it and, and that's kind of the, 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 the aim of the game, yeah. I love it because it's kind of like improv as well. So much improv, <laughs> yeah. Like we literally have nothing ready besides, okay, we're a dating show, you know, then it's we just have to work with what everyone gives us so yeah it's it's keeps you on your toes but it's so fun and then all the other actors you you know already yeah and the, the, 
It's only a small, yeah, it's only a, yeah, it's a small group that we organize. Like it's me and mainly a friend that, you know, Sarah Mitchell. Mm -hmm. So we source the people we think are right for the roles. In terms of actors, it's usually only maybe three, three or four of us that maintain that have an actual role in the show. We have other friends that play characters that just help us maintain energy and stuff. But, but yeah, we, we know them. They're usually some of our crew and some of them aren't even actors. They're just friends that want to play games you know yeah um yeah every now and then we might have one of our friends as a character come up and be one of the plants within the show just to create a bit of spice but no i love it. it it's so good like it was literally and i wanted to come see you last year but as you know my anxiety wasn't that good so i plan on coming anyway <laughs> when you're back in town this time yeah but um it's just so funny and it really brings out this giggle and laugh within yourself that is so childlike do you know what i mean it's just it really it brings out like i hate saying the word inner child but it like delights your inner child a little bit because you're allowed to let go and like you don't think about all the stress that you have going on in your life and you have like an hour of just like pure giggle i love yeah. that yeah yeah it is really nice it's really good for the heart. It's really good for the soul. You studied photography at QCA and now you're doing this. How did that whole thing go into fruition? Like, were you like, okay, I'm going to be a photographer and do this, but then you like led it into it. Like, how did that all happen? I started in my, in my undergrad, I kept on putting myself in front of the camera, like and playing little characters. And at first it was like, I had an idea, but organizing you know an actor or a model to be in front of the camera was just too much to organize so I just went all right I'll put myself in front of the camera and I've, I've never been camera shy and I've always been a bit of a clown so I did that and, and I got like people started to really like my work and and you know I exhibited a few times with some some of these little uh, I was making animations where I do stupid stuff like I like I defy the laws of physics by throwing a ball from one hand all the way over my head to the other hand and catching it while I also spun around and my beard shaved off as I was spinning around. And that's because I just did it in like one photo, shaved a bit, spun a bit, <laughs> took another photo and it was all and it, like stop motion. Um, oh, it's raining. Um, <laughs> you know, and then like I would build on that and make little like voiceovers for it and put on like, so I started getting into video in that way. And then I took a year off, but then I went back and did my honors. In my honors, I it was funny. Like I, I went, I'm not going to rely on me in front of the camera because that's kind of a gimmick and people just tend to think it's funny and I want to make work that's a bit more punchy and a bit more politically driven. Um, I've always been someone that really wants to talk about big issues, you know, and and like at that moment, I was really into colonization and, and first Australians and who we are, where we come from, where we belong and, and the sense of belonging. So I started doing this work around that without me in front of the camera. And I remember at the halfway point, I, we you have to do this uh, presentation of where you're at and you have these external assessors in. And the external assessors were like, watched me. It's like a half an hour presentation you have to do. They watched the whole thing. And by the end of it, and like these external assessors were like the one of the curators at GOMA in Brisbane, the one of the head people of Institute of Modern Art in Brisbane as well. So they were big wigs. Yeah, wow. And at the end of the, yeah, at the end of the presentation, you also have to show previous work to show where you came from. And at the end they went, that like that was absolute crap like you you made no sense at all your work isn't like substantiated in any way it, all the links you were drawing on or your research just like it's like you were just picking anything out and just making bullshit up but you were so entertaining to watch it was like just a pleasure watching you you know we were entertained for the whole half an hour and I was like oh you know so their advice was like why aren't you putting yourself in front of the camera you know why aren't you part of your work anymore so that made me think I took some time off to think about it and I came back and I started to study why I was so keen on putting myself in front of the camera and what that meant and it, and it led to me wanting to be a performer or wanting to perform and wanting to use my body as the, as the artistic tool, as the instrument to communicate rather than photography, right? That second half of my honours, I looked deeper into that. It, I ended up making these videos about my personal identity and who we are, that we all play different roles with different groups, you know, like you might be someone to your close friends, but someone very different to your family and someone very different to your workplace yeah. colleagues and like that. So I created these three characters called the artist, the teacher and the performer um, and made videos with them. 
And the very next, and that got a lot of recognition and I won a prize with that and all this kind of stuff. So the next step for that was like, okay, why aren't you doing this in front of live audiences? Why, you know, why are you stopping at being just in front of the camera? So I was lucky in that time as well. People saw my videos. They invited me to MC a couple of events. So I started emceeing a couple of things and I got the hang of it. And like about a year after I finished my honors, wrote my first show, which was titled the same as my honors project. It was titled Who is Danny Cabs? And I took it to Fringe World in Perth. I took it to Adelaide Fringe Festival. I took it to um, Melbourne Fringe. I took it to Anywhere Theatre Festival in Brisbane. I took it to Wonderland Festival at the Powerhouse in Brisbane. And since then, I kind of haven't looked back. I've just been, I've mainly been a, a physical performer, mainly around clowning, uh, you know, and, and, but that's how I led into it. That's the connection. Yeah. Just by putting myself in front of the camera. Oh my God. I love that yeah. story so much because it sounds yeah. like you learned a lot about who you are as well, which I think is so amazing and so transformative for what you create and the fact that you're the vessel of your work and looking inwards as well as performing outwards. I mean, it it all just kind of like synchronizes so beautifully, if that makes sense. I think I'm making sense. I'm I'm a little bit tired. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever still get like scared going in front of the camera? Not really. Like I, I, I'm not someone that is that great at remembering lines. Like I, I'm not good at good at memorizing lines. So in terms of like acting where I've got to remember a script, that's when I get a bit nervous. But um, in front of a camera or even up on stage, sure, there's a certain amount of nerves that exist that keep you on your toes. I, I feel at home. Like I, I feel like it's what I'm meant to do and what I'm good at doing. And so it, it's never a level of nerves that takes me so far that I don't want to be doing it. It's just enough where you, you know, keeps you fresh, keeps you on your toes. Yeah. Make sure that you're prepared. Do you have like yeah. a pre-stage ritual? Not hugely. The The only thing I've learned that is really good, one, I don't smoke weed before going on stage anymore. I For the first year or so, I thought, oh, maybe I can get a little bit stoned and it can get me a bit like silly and flowy. Um, but I've realized that's like a big no-no. So I'm 100% like with it. Why? What, what made you think that? I, I had good and bad experiences and I'd never get too high. Like maybe I'd have a little bit of an edible or I'd have like a like two, three tokes of a joint. So I'd never get too high and it was always cool. Sometimes I wouldn't, sometimes I get a bit in my own head about it and I wouldn't flow as good as I should. But, you know, that's in performing in general, you're not always at your best. But then there was this one time at Edinburgh Fringe where I was doing my a solo show there called um, Danny Cabs' Poncho Orange. Me and my tech, who was a good friend, we just went a bit. And a good friend, another good friend came to see the show that day and we all just had, a bit too much before the show and I had by far one of the worst shows I've ever had in my life it was like but all of us my tech was like a stunned muller and he was missing cues I was like oh, le, le, le. I couldn't even talk <laughs> and then my friend Sonia she was sitting in the front row and like white pale <laughs> and like paranoid and like knowing <laughs> she needed to give me energy but didn't have any energy to give me so we, <laughs> it was just it was just awful but I think halfway through the show I just did to run I'm so sorry. This is the worst thing ever. You can all have your money back. I, I can't believe this. And, you know, I was, I ended up being like really apologetic and, and I just learned you know, from that moment on that I, I just don't like, I, it, it's, it's hard being in front of a crowd and, and, and making sure you're in the flow and you're reading the audience well and all this kind of stuff. And it's even harder if you're not a hundred percent. like. And, and the thing with clowning, you know, we, which is different to maybe, what a stand-up comedian would do or what a theatre actor would do or whatever it be. Clowning is all about connecting with the audience. So like a, a, a true clown doesn't get up on stage and think he has the answers or has the funny jokes and just deliver them without connecting to the audience. A, a clown is there to show their vulnerabilities to and and to go along with the audience you know if something doesn't land you don't keep going that way you you think your feet and you change direction until you find the pathway that is working with that audience mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah you got to pivot yeah some, yeah, yeah you got to pivot you got to you know it's it's about connect, yeah you got to be there you know and you, you would have seen this with the with the at, at yonder with the dating show and the the weddings since it's all improv you got to be present with the audience so yeah so you just need to be you just need to be present so yeah you know perhaps if yeah 
so <laughs> yeah, yeah it works for, I guess so how yeah. how do you connect on like connect with the audience like what does that mean if someone who's not a performer but more of like say a viewer what do you mean by connect with the audience like you gauge like the vibe or how people are looking at it or like what do you mean by that when you give the audience something so you know I might come out and say something really you know maybe I have a a, a joke or something that I say straight away or something funny in my, my body that I do straight away and I gauge you know what's the response to that you know are they laughing at that oh no they're not laughing at that they're a bit quieter okay so maybe they they need a bit more time to get to know me before I can bring out something a bit more absurd, right? So you you listen to the audience responses to everything you give them. Um, also, like I'm someone that needs house lights on in a in a theater or in a in a comedy room, so I don't yeah. house lights are the lights that are across the audience. So I like to see people's faces. Like I don't have it full bolt, you know. There's still a lot more light on me on the stage, but if I can't see people's reactions and I can't look people in the eyes. I'm not able to connect. So it's also connecting by looking at people in the eyes. You know, when I talk to someone in an audience, I talk to them and actually talk to them, you know, and by connecting with that one person and then shifting my eyesight and finishing something with another person, sure, I've just made eye contact with two people in the audience, but everyone else around them feels it then that grows throughout the audience, you know, and, and I keep that up. So it's, it's about that. And yeah. And if, if you're throwing something out and it's not landing, you need to find a different direction, you know? So that's, that's the thing about connecting. And it's also, Oh my God. No, it's also, it's also about acknowledging when things don't land and acknowledging when things go good. Right. So I don't just, if something doesn't land, I don't just, pretend you know it was the best thing ever and keep on going no I I make the audience know that I'm aware that it didn't land you know I don't go oh poor me it didn't land I I just make fun of it and I'm like oops uh, that that's not the way it was meant to go let's try something else you know and <laughs> so they can see that I'm I'm with them so so I guess that's yeah that's that's the way I'm just so impressed. I'm sorry. Like my mind is blown because I originally thought, Danny, that you go into these shows and you like have like lines that you've like learned or whatever and you've you've just got like hit lists, but it's way more complicated than that. You've got to deal with like the audience and flow with them. And then if that's not working, you have like all these tricks up your sleeves. You're like the Mary Poppins of comedy. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's exactly <laughs> what I am, the Mary Poppins of comedy. You just um, got yeah it's something like that and and then you know it's not like that all the time it, it, you know then when when you know you then workshop things so much by connecting with the audience that eventually eventually you know that this works right like for example the first show i wrote with this character poncho orange it was that one danny cabs is poncho orange i didn't write any script and i just booked dates at Adelaide Fringe I booked two weeks of shows at Adelaide Fringe and I went let's see what happens I took I had a character and I took a, a table worth of orange props so like an orange feather duster an orange fly swatter a few orange bouncy balls and a mango uh, some oranges uh, I forget what else you know um, a little play plastic orange trumpet you know and I went in there and I just did that I just came out and spoke in my accent hello how are you beautiful people okay <laughs> let's play you know started to play with the audience and that first two weeks at Adelaide Fringe um, this is back in 2016 I didn't know what worked yet but every night I was trying semi new things and something would land tonight and I'd go all right let's try it tomorrow and see if it lands again and if it doesn't what did I do different or why didn't it land eventually after you know doing the show 12 times times or 15 times with another festival thrown in or whatever it be by the time you get to 15 20 shows you kind of have this thing where you go okay this is my show now you know it, it works within like it's like you say it's I've got a checklist of things I hit and within that I have areas to play and that's where I connect with my audience but I know that these things are pretty much funny right Mm -hmm. sometimes they might land not land as good as others whatever it be so eventually you work your way into some structure but you'd never lose that connection with the audience you never lose think that you've got the best show ever and and just you know rattle off these things without 
acknowledging whether it works or doesn't work or whatever it be in front of the audience so they know that you're present and you're yeah yeah you, you haven't got your head up your own ass you you're there like participating with them you know i had chewy behind my ear and uh, <laughs> that was one of the Cigarette. So where so did Poncho good. come from? Tell us about Poncho. And if you want to talk about Poncho and Poncho's voice, you totally can, by the way. Okay, so Poncho uh, was, uh, you know, my background is Uruguayan. So I'm a Latino. I'm a Latos. Okay, like Latino Australian. Latos, no lactose. I'm not lactose. I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I drink the oat milk. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, anyway. Uh, the, the lactose goes through me like a water through a fountain. You know, it's theoretically beautiful, but not if uh, your face is caught in a stream, you know, <laughs> it's a bad diarrhea. Okay, no, <laughs> but because like uh, where, where, where I, <laughs> now I'm going to talk as Danny Capps. Sorry. <laughs> I grew up, I, I grew up in a pretty rough area in South, the outer Southwest suburbs of Sydney, um, like an area in the suburbs of Cabramatta and Fairfield. So, past Parramatta for people that know Sydney and it, it was a rough area and but it was beautiful because it was very multicultural and and very eye-opening in that way you know um but because it was rough and you know poor and all that kind of stuff eventually when, when I moved to the eastern suburbs of Sydney and I was working like at that time I was in my early 20s and I was working in retail and you know, going out of parties and all this kind of stuff. I always felt like a, a class divide between me and all these Eastern suburb folk. You know, I had all these friends that grew up in Bronte and, you know, in Surrey Hills and all this kind of stuff. And I, I, I felt out of place, you know, because I was this like Westy, you know, like, like, you know, wog boy from, from Fairfield. And so, so one thing I used to do as a coping mechanism to sort of break that that ice when I was meeting these new people was I would just talk in my Latino accent because I did it really well. And I'd say, oh, hello, how are you today? Yes, my, na- my name is Danny. Pleased to meet you. Okay, boom, boom. And everyone was really intrigued by where I was from. Oh, where are you from? This is exciting, blah, blah. And eventually after, you know, a little bit of a conversation, I'd break it to them that, nah, I'm just from the West and blah, blah. So it created that icebreaker. So that's where that me speaking in that accent started. It was a a bit of a, you know, icebreaker, a bit of a um, way to, you know, to to get rid of a bit of social anxiety Um, because I was different, you know, but different in a good way, not different in a Westie, you know, whatever it be. So I, that's where it started. And this is many, 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 many years ago. And then, when I started playing, like playing, I, so I've done that all my life as as a as a bit of a plaything. But then when I started doing my honors and I started looking into these characters, I played the performer character. So I had the artist, the teacher, the performer. The performer character was this guy, you know, and I, I gave him different names. For a while, he was Chicho Valdez, and and you know, he then became Chico. But then one day I was doing it with a friend after a long day working video production at Blues Fest. We were just having a beer backstage, chilling out, long day. And I was, I had, it was cold and a friend lent me her orange shawl, you know, like that kind of yeah. looks like a poncho. And I was, I had my one foot up on a couch serenading her in my Latino accent. Her name's Steph McCarthy. And, um, and she gave me the name. She went, oh poncho orange like poncho the shawl and it's orange so she named me poncho orange and I went that's perfect because it's absurd enough it kind of sounds Latino but not and it's stupid and it's a piss take and that's that's where the character was born from so from my social anxiety and from feeling like I wasn't cool enough Anglo-Saxon eastern suburb Sydney people because I felt I didn't fit in so I made myself more exotic and then I put poncho in my first show called Who is Danny Cabs where it was just me as Danny's telling stories about where I grew up. I had him, I had three little videos of Poncho just just looking at the camera and saying, Poncho, orange, you know, just like so basic. But they were little one and a half minute videos where I could rush off stage, get changed into my next outfit, 
and come back on stage, right? And everyone after that show would go, who's this Poncho guy? He's really interesting. You know, I would love to see more with Poncho. Um, so what I did the following year in 2016, after touring that first show, all of 2015, I lent into that character and I just went, okay, I'm not going to be Danny Cabs anymore. I'm just going to be Poncho for a whole show and I'm going to make it all about play. So so then Poncho, instead of having stories and stuff, Poncho was 100% about play and I'd just literally go in there and climb over audiences and make the audience all get up and get into a circle and hold hands and sing Kumbaya and I don't know what else, you know, like we'd, we'd just do a lot of stupid stuff, you know. It's, at times I would get an audience member up from the stage and get them, like, go to give them an orange and uh, or a slice of orange and as they go to get it, I snatch it away and we keep doing that until it grows this tension and then finally I put the orange in my mouth, half in my mouth, and they have to get it off me. <laughs> and then I'm like, no, 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 with your mouth. And then they have to go get it from me with their mouth. But then as they go to kiss me and get it off from me, I pull away again. And like that at times would lead into this big rumble where they I'd have this grown man usually because I usually pick a man to sort of mess up things, you know, and I think, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it, it's not good if I'm this cis, what kind of mostly white male picking women to make out. Yeah. With them. You know, yeah. Not, not a good look. <laughs> no. So I'd pick, I'd usually pick the most mask men I could find. Um, and by the end of it, they'd like be rumbling me and trying to like tackle me and trying to get their mouth to my mouth. And it was <laughs> hilarious. They would never want to kiss a guy in their lives, you know. So so Poncho was just this chaos demon, you know, that that just wanted to play. Whereas now he's gotten to a point where, all right, he's played a lot. And within this new show that I'm touring currently, he's a lot deeper than that. You know, he, he tells stories um, similar to my first show. He tells stories about, who he is, what he loves, where he came from, how he identifies, leans into, eventually gets to stories about facing some really toxic masculine behavior in my life and being hurt by it, both like emotionally and physically, and how that's a big issue within society. If a hypersexualized, strong, you know, um, confident Latino man can feel threatened, unsafe, by in the presence of other men then how can the rest of the population you know how how do the lgbt lgbtqi population feel in front of men how do um women feel in front of men you know how do elderly feel in front of young um over overly zealous men you know so poncho now still is absurd, still is very playful, but he's um, trying to communicate messages about needing to, for men needing to break down barriers and be vulnerable so we can actually be a bit more empathetic and and, and start to be a, a lot more positive rather than toxic. So anyway, he, he's come a long way in the last sort of I six, seven that. years. I love that. Do you yeah. discuss men's mental health? Yeah, I I, I, I do. I, I discuss, um, like, my show is called Keep It Up, um, which is, you know, a double entendre with, you know, being able to keep up your silly willy. You know, you've got to keep it up. But also I, I the, the, one of my opening lines in the show is, you know, that I'm a professional, yet at times I feel self-doubt. So I, I tap into the you know, uh, feelings of self-doubt, imposter syndrome, all that kind of stuff. And then at the end, I talk about how hard it is for men to, I don't just say, hey, we need to be vulnerable. I, I, I communicate how hard it is for all of us to be vulnerable because we've been taught we're not allowed to be. So mm-hmm. I, I tap into how how bad it has been for men as well. You know, I'm not, not in a, you know, I'm not playing the violin for men, you know, because... Oh, no, I totally think we should play yeah. the violin for men. I mean, I've had a lot of male In friends commit suicide, so I think we totally should. It's what, number one killer of men in Australia is suicide. So There you go. And and it's, yeah. and it's and, and I would say it's from this. It's because they don't feel they can be vulnerable. So when they start showing signs that they're weak, that they can't cope, that all this kind of stuff, because we all show those signs and we all have that in us, um, you'd have to be. Superman to not be able to feel that, but even Superman is feels vulnerability and all that kind of stuff. It, it's like, hey, it's hard because we've been taught not to feel that way, but we can do it and we can do it together. So that's the the message. 
you know, that poncho communicates. And then he deep throats it and he says, Dari, Dari, man, I, I've got you. And then I pull a banana out and I deep throat a banana. <laughs> I love that. You're so funny, Danny. It's nice to talk to you. Oh, thank you. You're such a sweetheart. Honestly, I'm so impressed. I was looking at your website and I was like, holy fuck. Like, I know I've known you for like a little while now, but I was like, wow. Like now that I'm doing this podcast and learning about all my creative friends, I was like, wow, my friends are like really fucking creative. I've just been stuck in my own little echo chamber for too long, I think. So you should be so proud of yourself. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I feel like the same with you, you know, and what you do, you know, you, you're one of the pioneers of something that's quite common now, but you, you've been doing it for years and, and you're leading the way in that collage art and digital collage and all that kind of stuff. And it's, your work is incredible. It's incredible. Oh, thanks, babe. I appreciate it. But this is about you, sweet. It's not about me. <laughs> okay, bring it on. <laughs> I have a question here, which I think you've already answered, but I, I would love to clarify it, which is what has been your most favorite creation by far? Would it be Poncho? Um, but, you, but you were already were Poncho, so I don't know if it was a creation per se. Yeah, but the shows I make with him are, are creations, you know, like he is me, like we we exist together. I'd say in terms of shows, I'm I'm super happy with with the show this this current show. I think it's the best thing I've ever made. So I am super proud of that. And it's because I've you know a lot of my other shows were very improv based, and sure they eventually got to a point where they were structured, but they were a lot more dependent on on just like let's see if we can make it work today, which is pretty exciting. But but it has its limitations. Whereas this show has a lot of areas for playing it and for that improvisation. And they're some of the best bits in the show. But but I've created a show that's that's got a really clear message in a really funny and absurd way. So it's it's not like I'm lecturing anyone. I, I strongly feel that every time I'm performing the show, it's even on the days I feel I'm not the sharpest, it's still a great show. I'm getting really good feedback from all my audiences, from all the reviewers. Like I, I just did a season in Perth at Fringe World Festival. It's by far my most successful season outside of Brisbane, which is, you know, Brisbane Gold Coast is is where I have my community and people know me. So I can I can I can gain audiences and everyone's been really lovely in my home towns. Perth have just the audience came on board and and each night it grew and grew. I had so many people posting about my show on socials, so many people leaving reviews on the website. I had a couple of good reviewers come in, give me really solid reviews that were up in there like four or four and a half stars. You know, and I don't want to say that it's all about uh, getting reviews or getting stars for your show, but but it's nice when you when you're just backing it up night after night and you're getting this this kind of feedback because I do get, I do doubt myself and my abilities and and what I've created you know it's I think it's just what is for for the artist you know like I sometimes wish I had this confidence flowing through me that I just didn't doubt myself and I you know I wonder how much I could achieve if I had that level of confidence in me but I also at the same time I feel this this self-doubt is what keeps me on my toes and makes sure that I'm not getting um complacent so i'm i'm super proud of this show because it's it's excellent and, and to read and and to hear people that are yeah to, to like to get really good feedback from one from women you know i'm coming at this as a hypersexualized man and and i get a lot of really good feedback from female remu- uh, reviewers and audience members that and I don't want to say it in a way like, yeah, I'm Mister, I'm the best ally for the feminist movement. Because no, it's not that. But but I made this show to be an ally, but also to be an ally to all other men. So we could actually start to think positively about working together. You know, all of us working and playing together. To you know, I, I have a, th- a line in my show, and it's like, perhaps it's time to approach all relationships, including one with self. Without ego-driven expectations, ultimatums, and um, secret stations, <laughs> because uh, no one wants the crabs, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> because when our powers combine, it's going to be so much easier to keep it up, you know. And I, I seriously think that. I seriously think that when we actually lean into working together, things are going to be so much easier for everyone. Why cisgendered men to to 
trans women to non-binary this person and that to like everyone you know people of color we just have to work together that's the that's the underlying message to anything and and one that i want to communicate as an artist and i'm starting to get feedback from everyone about how I'm hitting that point and, and, you know, I'm making it clear and, and I feel really proud of it. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that, yeah, the latest thing I'm working on is, is what I'm most proud of. I love that. And it sounds like, honestly, it sounds like it's so beautiful and I'm actually really pissed that I didn't come last year. Are you coming to Brisbane anytime soon to do it? Oh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully something. I, I, I don't have any plans yet just because I've I've done two little runs in Brisbane already. So I don't I don't want to oversaturate, um, extend myself too far. But who knows? You know, who knows? Um, so do you have any self-care when you come out of Poncho? Like, do you wind down in a certain way or because it sounds like you're very in tune to like your, your own mental health. Do you practice self-care at all? Lately, I've been a bit lazy I I used to I used to do a lot of like yoga and meditation I I, for for a few years especially at the start of my performance career I really got not super heavy into it but I was practicing sort of at least 15 minutes of meditation a day and and practicing you know a good sort of hour of yoga you know three to four times a week since the tail end of you know uh, COVID so 2021 I've um I've been a bit lazy and haven't really practiced anything like that self-care wise for me all the all the performing and all the giving of energy in that way and I'm also quite busy in doing these things called um silent disco walking tours I'm one of the key guides for a a company called Guru Dudu Silent Disco Walking Tours where I just like dance on the street with 50 people with headphones on and and I've got a mic on and for example I just did a two-week tour in Christchurch in New Zealand and I did um, 12 of these one hour dance parties in like across the Christchurch city over like nine days, you know, and like it's physically, it's very draining as well, um, as well as emotionally. But for me, my wind down is I just need like couch time. Like I just need to sleep and I just need to relax on the couch. And I love just watching series of things, you know, whether like I just finished watching Andor, the one of the spin-offs from Star Wars series. And for me, that's that turns my brain off, that relaxes my body. Um, you know, I make sure I eat well. I like cooking stuff with a lot of veggies. This um, is all self-care. Stuff. Yeah, it's all self-care. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I, I just sometimes get a bit, um, and I shouldn't, but I, I get a bit angry at myself for not also stretching and this and that because I know my body needs that, especially as I get older. But um, but the, the self-care I participate in is, oh, and it's beach time. I've been living by the beach in Coolangatta for three years. So I just go for swims. If the surf's nice and chill because I don't like overexerting myself as I'm physically and mentally exhausted, I go for a nice surf on my longboard and sit out in the water for two hours at sunset. That's my self-care, you know, go for walks along the beach, spend time with my partner, Nadia. Um, that's that's how I just chill out. But also a lot of alone time. I need alone time when I'm when I come off a tour. Yeah. I love that you live like the most perfect life in my mind. Anyway, I'm like seeing it as like this really beautiful because I would love to live next to the beach <laughs> and be able to surf on a dream of mine my whole life. Yeah. And I just made it happen three years ago, but it, <laughs> it took a while. Oh my God. It's so beautiful. So what advice do you have for other performers or artists? Um, I guess it's, it's that it's listening to what you need, you know, um, also, like a big part of self-care is not overthinking how productive you need to be or you should be. You know, I, I I feel my mental health suffers when I start to compare myself to other artists that I've been performing alongside over the last, you know, six, seven years. And a lot of I've seen a lot of these artists and their their output is two, three times more than what I'm doing. You know, they're creating a different show each year, you know, and in seven years they've created seven shows, eight shows and you know, I'm, I'm up to my fourth. I think for anyone out there, you know, it's about following your flow. It's about listening to what you need. You know, if you need time off from something, take time off. Don't think you need to meet a deadline that you've set yourself because you've set yourself that. Sure, it's important to reach goals and all that kind of stuff, but things change and 
life is fluid and appreciate that and go with that and go with that fluidity and don't put pressure on yourself. And I say this because that's exactly what I need to be telling myself because that's what hurts me the most is when I overthink things, when I compare myself, when I don't feel I'm productive enough, all that kind of stuff, then Mm -hmm. I get in a really dark place. So, yeah. So what I'm hearing is be kind to yourself. Comparison is the thief of joy and just go with it. Yeah, go with the flow. So what do you have going on in 2023, Danny? The main thing is touring. So I've got almost a a different city each month uh, leading up to June, July. Um, So I just, so I did Woodford at the start of the year. Then I did Christchurch mid-Jan. Then I did Perth, start of Feb. Then I'm going to Adelaide, um, start of March. Then I got Melbourne start of April. Then I've got Sydney mid-May. And then end of June, I've got Townsville. Both in Adelaide and in Townsville, I'm doing both the silent disco walking tours. And then I do a season of my show. So, And I'm just hoping I pick up more. Like I, I, I wouldn't mind hopefully maybe, I don't know, if everything goes well, maybe someone wants to take me over to to edinburgh in august in the uk but i won't do it on my own i want to do it with a producer or a promoter but if not i'm hoping i i get darwin festival out to see my show in adelaide they asked me to come along to darwin because darwin festival is meant to be amazing the whole city really get behind the arts there um and they bring a lot of great artists in so for me that's that's what my 2023 is and i think at the same time i think it's I'm I'm actually energized for this to actually start writing a, a my a new show that I can perhaps start touring next year in 2024 and and just back up with two really strong shows back to back hopefully because I did like you you took a couple of years off and I I took a couple of years off leading up to COVID and then of course COVID was was um another year and a bit off <laughs> yeah. so I, I I kind of feel like I do have the energy to to yeah create a a couple of things you know back to back. But we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. That's so amazing. You've got so much going on. Mm. I feel like everybody that I talk to on this show, <laughs> they have so much going on. And I'm just like, I'm just cruising along. <laughs> like, yeah. Interviewing incredible. artists, making a podcast, <laughs> creating this incre- incredible, um, you know, graphic artwork, you know, so artwork. So I, I think, oh, I, I think on the look, flip side, you same point comparison is the thief of joy there exactly we go. <laughs> exactly no and... like, i'm just so impressed like i hate traveling and like i would hate to be going to all these different cities but then again like it would be so magical and amazing i feel so lucky i get exhausted you know because i i do love i'm i'm part cancer i'm like a I'm a strong cancer. I'm, I'm actually born in the, on the last day of cancer. So I've got this big home, you know, nurturing side to me. So I love home and I mi- like I miss home when I'm away, but I also Leo rising and stuff. So I love adventure and exploration. So I, I feel very fortunate that I get to travel with what I love and, and, I'm I'm never alone when I travel because I travel into these festivals and into these communities where I just always have people to connect with. Sure, there's you know I do a lot on my own when I travel on my own, but but in in general, there's always someone to lean into when you need you know, and there's always good. There's like a sense of community. Yeah, 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 and it's really lovely. Um, like I was, I remember like I the last show I wrote was 2017, and then I I toured that show and and my first poncho show up until mid 2018. But then from then on in, I I wasn't touring any of my shows. I was getting around festivals with the silent disco stuff, but that wasn't my project. That was just me as an employee, as a paid artist. Um, So I felt like a bit of an outsider, but that was purely my own, you know, my own um, thought process and my own insecurities, imposter syndrome and all that. I I felt when I wrote this show and I I got back on the circuit, one of the big things I was thinking to myself was like, everyone's going to say, oh, what's Danny Cabs doing? Why is he bringing another show? And just, you know, like, you know, wasn't he finished? Or isn't he just the silent disco guy? And I I really felt like I wasn't going to be accepted back into this uh, community of, uh, you know, of, of performers and comedians. But it's the total opposite, you know, from the get go, you know, everyone's just been so welcoming, so beautiful, you know, and so many doors and and 
have opened up because of that. And, and it's, again, it's, it's the same thing that I try to, you know, promote it's, you know, play brings community together and, and we're all there ready to play. You know, I had this realization at Melbourne Comedy Fest last year, the first festival I came back and did after my time away. And I was so nervous about it, but instantly I got asked to um, be a backup dancer for Stu Dolman in the limp lip sinking battle that they do at, at, um, at Max Watts at the festival club. Yeah. And it's big, like these, like all the comedians that get asked to do this really big up, bring up big productions. It's hilarious. So I was, I was in a change room with about 20 other artists, only three key performers, but everyone had backup dancers and support and this and that. We're in this tiny change room, like tiny green room at like 1am on a Thursday night in Melbourne, six, seven of us were dressed in leotards with ribbons. You had, you know, Geraldine Hickey, which is one of Australia's top comedians. They were dressed in a blow up penis costume. You know, uh, who else was it? Um, Nikki Britton was dressed as a nun. We were all just playing like kids. You know, yeah. we we're all these adults, you know, ranging from early to mid twenties to, to who knows how old some of the older ones are. I'm 41, somewhere in their fifties, maybe. And we're all just big kids playing together, you know, coming out to a, a room, a, a theater full of like 450 people cheering and chanting and, and dancing and partying. And, you know, it, it's, it's beautiful. Like I had this realization going, Oh my God, I do this for a living. Like this is, this is what I get to do. Just play like a kid. Like this is paradise. So I'm very lucky. I don't know. I went on a tangent there, but I'm no, super I lucky. love that. Is that recorded yeah. anywhere? Can I see this? Nah, nah, not recorded anywhere. It's, it was live, live theater. You got to come down to Melbourne or, or Adelaide friends, just come down for a few days, do a long weekend and I'll take you out to show shows and see things and you'll get to I would love that and I want to meet your girlfriend Nadia yeah 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 she's great you, you get to meet her oh yeah, she's she... lovely I've seen the Penelope character so incredible I mean I feel like so in next month I'm going up to Mackay to go and do some like art stuff up there and I'm hoping that when I go up there not to compare but I hope when I go up there on the plane because I hate traveling I will have that realization of being like oh no this is really nice because I just get to have fun and I get paid mm. for it <laughs> you know yeah. And do what you, you love. Yeah. I don't know. It's just life is fucking weird, Danny. Like, <laughs> I feel like World War Three is going to be called at like any minute. Yeah. And there's like this whole culture crisis going on where people are just getting more and more and more divided. Mm. So I try to like not feed my inner pe pessimism, which is my top life trap, by like feeding myself with this art. So I feel mm. like theatre kind of helped evoke that a little bit more than like just going to a gallery like every time I've gone to theatre it's just been so immersive and beautiful like I don't know am I making any sense I am so tired sorry <laughs> no, you make perfect sense and and I think that's the power of theatre like live theatre and comedy and counting and all that it's that it it throws up a mirror to society and then just sort of just cracks it you know yeah so it makes you go Oh, is this what I'm looking at? And crack. Ah, that's what it actually is. You know what I mean? So it, it is a really nice, um, I think it's essential. I think it's essential, you know, but, but so is all of, all of art, you know, you'll go up and do some, I'm guessing you're doing some workshops or something up in Mackay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you will bring this, this art form to people where they can create these alternate universes. They can create a world that they want to see, you know, through, through what you give them, you know, and they can actually imagine that. You know, that's your power. That's your tool. And in the same way that, you know, I create this universe through my clowning, you know, whatever it be, you know, for people, we need to be diving into this and putting more time into it. And, and of course, the government's not going to do it, you know, because they're, yeah. they're right with lining their pockets with fossil fuel money and all this kind of stuff. So it's about us to lead the way. And, and also you're doing that through this podcast, you know? And, yeah. Well, yeah. I think the biggest thing that always pisses me off whenever I talk to people about art, like just anybody, is if they'll be like, oh, I can't be creative. I'm not creative or I'm not artistic. Yeah. And I'm like, that's fine. But like, you can still like try. <laughs> like, yeah, you can still play. You can still play. Yeah. We all start playing. We didn't start start being accountants and we didn't start being lawyers and we just didn't start being whatever other profession you want to throw in there what we did start doing is playing 
and being creative. We did that before anything. You know what? I am going to use that response the next time I'm on Tinder or Hinge or whatever and someone's like, oh, what do you do? I'm an artist. And I'll be like, oh, I'm not creative. I'll be like, actually, I was talking to my friend Danny Cabs and he brought up this really great point. (laughs) You're just out of practice. Yeah, you're just out of practice. When we were kids, we were playing because when I watch my my niece play, I love it so much because I see her playing with these like toys and like, you know, she has this um, baby of color called Frankie who she really loves. And then she has this other like monkey thing that she loves and she'll, she'll just be playing with them and then she'll like pass it to me. And, and I just like, love that. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. oh, and then she'll just be like babbling off to herself doesn't really speak so but should just be babbling off to herself saying something and I'll just be like wow I wonder what is it's like in your imagination right now without all this like like, she's like one one, literally turned one yeah yeah but like without all this chaos and stress of the outside world I'm like I wonder how beautiful your imagination is and I wish I could remember what that was like as a kid yeah isn't yeah. that wild? It's it's beautiful. I feel the same with my nieces and nephews. I get in a real, yeah, I just tap into like 100% play with them and wait until she grows a bit older where you can start throwing her around and, and you know, she's just going to want to be on top of you playing games constantly. And that's, that's one of the best, you know, you, you asked about self-care. Like I haven't seen my my family they live in brisbane so my brother sister mum, and and my brother and sister have kids i haven't seen them for like over a month because i've been touring and i made sure i got to see him on monday night i stayed the night in brisbane and i the first i didn't get to see my brother's family because it was too much to see but i i got to see my mum. but I, I went to my sister's house and saw my three my two nephews and my niece and because they bring so much joy to my heart you know because they still have that element of playing them you know like i it, it's sad you know my my oldest nephew he's 12 right he just turned 12 and and he you know unfortunately he's in that place where it's starting to be like he needs to be cool and he's worried about what people think and all that kind of stuff right and this is the the point where we start to lose that 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 playful nature we have inside of us all that creativity and i remember this one time about um a few months ago I, I was staying with them for a couple of nights because I had work in Brisbane. And this one night he was being all cool and he's got headphones, listening to music and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And whereas I was playing with his younger brother and younger sister like crazy, we were like playing this, playing that. My niece, who's like six, she wants to do X Factor constantly and perform for everyone. And um, um, he would just sit next to me, but just like be Mr. Cool on his headphones. And... I didn't give him, I didn't go, come on, man, just loosen up. I didn't give him any of that. I just went, oh, oh, what do you listen to? Oh, that's cool. Anyway, cool. And then I just keep on playing. And within like half an hour, an hour of us being playing, he couldn't help but go back but into what that. What are you doing? Tape. Yeah. You know, his headphones came off. And by the end of it, it was, you know, the three of us in like rumble piles and, you know, me chewing on their calves and, you know, another one hanging off my head, breaking my neck nearly. And this guy, one running across the room and jumping on me. And by the end of it, we were all, we were four kids. You know, we weren't a 12 year old that was self-conscious, a 41 year old that probably should grow up one day. No, I shouldn't. Um, You know, like we were all, we were all six, seven, eight years. Like we were all in that kid, you know, mega kid role. And, you know, it's, we need to be able to tap into that. You know, we need to be able to tap into that for our own, for our own um, well-being. It's so beautiful. Totally. Wow. I need to stop saying totally, but. Nah, always, totally. Whatever, totally. I'm like, I sound like a stoner and I don't even smoke weed. But like, <laughs> no, every time I come on here and talk to somebody or one of my friends or whatever, it's just like my mind just gets like I'm getting out of my echo chamber. You know what I mean? And I'm hearing more perspective. Yeah. But Daddy, yeah. I'm going to have to wrap the conversation up. Do you yeah. have any last things that you would like to say? No, I just love talking to you. That was really nice. Hopefully we'll get to catch up soon and I can't wait to hear this episode because I love listening to myself. Ha, ha, ha. Um, <laughs> you're amazing. And I think, and I think what you're doing and that you're giving artists voices and you're spreading it to, to the general public, I think is very important. I think it's exactly what we need. So thank you for that. You are so welcome. Of course. You're amazing. Oh no, you're amazing, babe. Um, oh, one, one more thing. One yeah. more thing. If you're in Adelaide, look up poncho, keep it up poncho. It's like the thing you wear to keep you dry but I actually get you wet. Um, so look up Poncho. 
um, at Adelaide Fringe Festival, Melbourne International mm-hmm. Comedy Festival, at Sydney Comedy Festival, Poncho, at all those three festivals. And come I'll put, see me, I'll, please. Yeah, I'll put the I'll put a link to your website, but I'll also put links to your yeah. shows so yeah, people yeah, can yeah. see that. Great. No, that's Thank okay. You. That's okay. If you liked this episode, you can share, rate on your listening app, or follow me on Instagram. This episode was produced, recorded, and edited in Menjin, Brisbane. One eight hundred Mad Butt would like to pay respect to elders, past, present, and emerging. Thank you.